afternoon and good evening. My name is Gabrielle, or Gabby Hampson, and I am the director of the Global Community Liaison Office, or GCLO. Um, thank you for joining us today for our fourth and our final Ask GCLO Live session this year. Uh, in September, you had a chance to meet with our support services and crisis management teams, and today you'll have a chance to get to know our education and youth team and to ask them some questions. Before you meet our GCLO subject matter experts, I'd like to introduce GCLO's division chief, Ramona Sandoval, who oversees these teams. Ramona will be moderating today's session. So let me turn it over to you, Ramona, and thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Gabby, and thank you all for joining us today. As Gabby said, my name is Ramona Sandoval, and I'm one of the division chiefs in GCLO. My husband and I joined the Foreign Service in 2010 and have served in Brasilia, Frankfurt, and recently returned from Mexico City, where I served as the CLO coordinator for two years. I joined the awesome GCLO team in July, and I'm so happy to be part of this team, and I'm really happy to be here with you all today. I'm so excited to feature our education and youth team who will share information on how they support you and your families with the important education decisions as you move from post to post and back to the U.S. We are all family members in GCLO. We've all served overseas and in the U.S. We understand the unique challenges faced by parents and children as they move around the world and are looking forward to answering your questions today. During this session, you will meet the team, hear more about their work, and have an opportunity to ask questions and get answers from our subject matter experts. Thank you again for joining us and let's meet the team. First, I would like to introduce Charlotte Larson. Charlotte is our education and youth officer. Charlotte. Thanks, Ramona. Hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte Larson and I'm the education and youth officer in GCLO. I've been in EFM for 26 years. 22 of those years, we were posted to six overseas assignments, Kiev, Melbourne, Guatemala City, Santiago, Seoul, Brussels, and now Washington, D.C. And we raised three children in our Foreign Service family from birth through college during those postings. We navigated local preschools in foreign countries, international schools for elementary, middle, and high school, boarding school for one of my three children, and college applications and acceptances for our first two from overseas to U.S. universities, allowing them to repatriate for the first time as college freshmen. My professional career as an EFM spanned working in the private sector for a multinational consulting firm to being a stay-at-home mom, then getting my master's degree in education, and prior to joining state, I taught in international and Department of Defense schools. I then shifted gears and worked as a global employment advisor, supporting EFM employment in Asia and Europe, and served as a community liaison office coordinator at a large tri-mission. And now I've been fortunate to be in my current role with GCLO since August 2020. Great, thanks so much, Charlotte. Now I'd like to introduce Rebecca McPherson, who is our Education and Youth Specialist. Off to you, Rebecca. Thanks, Ramona. Hello, everyone. My name's Rebecca McPherson, and I've been an eligible family member for eight years, serving at two overseas posts and now here in DC. I joined the Global Community Liaison Office as the Support Services Program Specialist, and then in September of 2021, I moved portfolios and I'm now the Education and Youth Program Specialist. My family and I were posted to Manila in the Philippines and to Lusaka, Zambia before returning to DC for two domestic tours. As of next summer, my husband and I will be heading out to post in Luanda, Angola. While we were overseas, our three daughters had the opportunity to attend both middle and high schools in the assisted schools at post, and our oldest applied to college and then started college in the U.S. while uh, we were in our second tour. My career began in the private sector as a sales consultant in publishing, followed by full-time ministry in New York City and then South Africa. I then became a real estate agent, investor, and property manager in Maryland for 12 years. When we joined the Foreign Service, I worked as a biometrics facilitator in Manila and also as an administrative assistant in the American Citizen Services. And then in Lusaka, I had the opportunity to serve as a community liaison office coordinator. So I joined the team here in GCLO in January of 2020. Back to you, Ramona. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. So Charlotte and Rebecca make up our wonderful education and youth team. They're always happy to answer your education questions. With introductions complete, I'm going to pass it back to Charlotte to give you an overview of the portfolio. Charlotte? Thanks, Ramona. 
So our team of two responds daily to inquiries related to the opportunities and the challenges of education and youth in the Foreign Service. Often we respond directly through phone calls and email communication with clients to address the questions in a timely manner. The three issues that we hear about most frequently are questions related to special needs education, education allowances, and transitioning from school to school, including general information on Washington area public schools. GCLO hosts a variety of web pages on the topics I just mentioned, as well as homeschooling, virtual learning, boarding school, college and beyond, adult education, childcare, preschools and summer camps, and foreign service scholarships and youth award opportunities. And we are constantly revising and updating what's on the web to ensure that our clients get the accurate information they need when they need it. Our team also strategizes on how and when to highlight specific education and youth updates via GCLO's many information channels, including the GCLO Weekly, the GCLO Facebook page, and the GCLO Connection newsletter that goes out to close. Another way that we communicate important trends and information is writing articles in the Foreign Service Journal in their education supplement editions in June and December. We just wrote an article for this month's issue that will be published and available in the next few days titled What You Need to Know Foreign Service Students Returning to U.S. Public Schools with Special Education Needs. And the link to that article will be in next Monday's GCLO Weekly. In the Education Youth Portfolio, we compile portfolio metrics, we track concerns to identify trends, and discuss findings within GCLO and with our key partner offices, such as the Office of Overseas Schools, the Office of Allowances, and MEDS Child and Family Programs, and other partners like the Foreign Service Youth Foundation, also known as FSYF. So as a result of this effort, GCLO's resources benefit from both GCLO's knowledge of client issues plus complete explanations of the regulations and guidelines provided by our partner office subject matter experts. As the education and youth portfolio team, Rebecca and I are ready to guide employees and family members on topics related to education and youth in the Foreign Service through guidance in navigating departmental systems and taking on an advocacy role when appropriate to advocate within the department for policy changes to better serve the foreign service community. In short, GCLO Education and Youth is a great place to reach out if you have any questions or need guidance on anything related to education and youth in the foreign service. Back to you, Ramona. Awesome, thanks Charlotte for sharing more about how you and Rebecca support the community. With that, we'll get to the meat of the session and get to the Q&A portion. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance via Slido. We will be answering these questions as well as questions in the chat box. If we don't get to your question, we will take note of them and share information through GCLO Weekly, our weekly newsletter, which Charlotte just mentioned, and our Facebook page. And you can always email the team directly with your questions at ask. At, excuse me, at GCLO, ask education at state.gov. All right, let's get to it. The first question came from a family who is thinking about college. I'm sending this question to you, Rebecca. We have been overseas so long and have no idea how to navigate the college application and research process. What resources do you have? That's a great question and one that I needed answers to when I when our oldest was applying to college. So I'm happy to answer this. A great place to start your research is our College and Beyond webpage. And that's where you can find a wealth of information and resources. You can learn about the application process, tips on finding the right college, scholarship search engines. You can even find links to virtual campus tours, financial aid options, and so much more. Our team has also compiled a list of frequently asked questions, FAQs, on the college process specifically for students of foreign service families, and the link will be in the chat for you. You can also look at our scholarships and youth awards page for links to many different scholarship opportunities from our different partner offices in AFSA, which is the American Foreign Service Association, AAFSW, which is the Associates of the American Foreign Service Worldwide, and FSYF, as Charlotte mentioned earlier, the Foreign Service Youth Foundation. We make the effort to provide the community with the most up-to-date resources. And we've just added uh, the Overseas School College Board 2022 Admissions Leaders Roundtable. That webinar was on November 9th, and if you missed it, it's on our GCLO ENY page. Back to you. 
All right, thanks for sharing all those great resources. The next question is on education allowances. We did receive a variety of allowances questions on Slido and we will do our best to answer. But please remember that the Office of Allowances is the best place to go for your specific question. They have great resources, which you will hear more about today. And I'm going back to you, Rebecca, with the next one. What are the rules for allowances and travel for college students? What is paid when they leave post? Do they get a shipment, two tickets home? Okay, so the Department of State Standardized Regulations, which is also known as the DSSR, is the prevailing regulations for all allowances. And you will hear this acronym DSSR a lot throughout this session today. In the DSSR 281, it defines educational travel as travel to and from a school offering a full-time course of secondary in lieu of an education allowance or post-secondary education. Basically, it's one round trip per 12-month period to and from an employee's foreign post for an eligible child who attends either a secondary school, grades 9 through 12, or an accredited college, university, or other post-secondary institution full-time in or outside of the U.S. Employees cannot receive an education allowance and an educational travel allowance simultaneously on behalf of their children. Educational travel shouldn't be confused with the transportation portion of the education allowance when a child attends a school that's away from the employee's foreign post of assignment. There are multiple FAQs on educational travel, and those are available on our GCLO ENY College and Beyond webpage, and that links directly to the Office of Allowances FAQs on educational travel. You can also just go directly to the allowances page if you'd like. But there are 21 very detailed questions and answers regarding things like anniversary dates, the shipment of the unaccompanied air baggage or UAB, or if a child chooses to store uh, their items at school, cost constructing, when you can travel, when the travel can be used, etc. And you always want to check with your financial management officer, the FMO at post. And if you need further guidance, please reach out uh, directly to allowances. And all of those uh, links and the Office of Allowances email will be in the chat. Okay, great, thank you. I'm sending the next question um, back to Charlotte, or to Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, who can help better support our kids' transition to schools in DC? Military kids have an advocate in the school districts. What about other agencies? Thanks, Ramona. This is uh, such a timely question. Helping our foreign service children transition to US public schools in the DMV area and having a direct contact in those schools has been a goal of GCLO as well. So I'm really glad this question was asked. Our team has recently spent some time reaching out to the various school districts in DC, Maryland, and Virginia, also referred to as the DMV, to establish relationships with a specific point of contact for enrollment for our foreign service students. We plan to stay in contact with these partners and update their contact information annually to ensure that we have someone to point families to in the main school districts in the DMV area. We, really, we spent time discussing with these partners the unique challenges that our foreign service children face in returning to US public school system, and all of them were eager to support our foreign service families in transition to ensure that students and the families feel supported upon their return. Families can reach out directly to our team for the contact person in the school district that you're interested in enrolling in. We wanna help connect you to the right person from the very beginning. Our team has a very extensive web page specifically designed to support children and their families as they transition from school to school. You can find information and resources on topics like choosing a school for your child, returning from an IB curriculum overseas to a DMV public high school, returning from a British curriculum overseas, choices for high school, IB and AP, public and private schools in the DMV, and transition training in the Foreign Service Child, publications, and other support resources. Additionally, there's a GCLO article from June 2020, the Education Supplement edition of the Foreign Service Journal, to guide families through the process of transitioning their children back to a U.S. public school after being overseas in an international school. And we're going to drop the link to that article 
uh, in the chat box for you. So that's a, a really great place to start. And then also our web page. Back to you, Ramona. Great, thank you. And thanks for the great idea to share a link to the article on transitioning back to US public schools. It has a lot of great information. Charlotte, going back to you with a few questions on special needs programs and allowances. The first question is, we saw there are recent changes to the special needs education allowance. Who decided to make the changes and why? Thank you, Ramona. The State Department's Office of Allowances recently updated the Special Needs Education Allowance, also known as SNEA, in response to an Office of Inspector General, referred to as the OIG audit. So the Department of State standardized regulations, the DSSR, revisions to the SNEA rates methodology accurately capture the average actual costs, allowing posts and bureaus to budget accordingly. So that was the reason behind it. Uh, amendments to the Foreign Affairs Manual, uh, 3FAM 3280, the Special Needs Education Allowance that were effective November 14, 2022, were, were to increase the transparency of the SNEA process and streamline the methodology for calculating the rate of allowance. Uh, for more details or questions on a specific situation, please email the Office of Allowances and we'll put this their email in the chat, but it's allowancesO at state.gov. Back to you, Ramona. Thanks. And continuing with the special needs questions, um, Charlotte, the next one um, is what programs assist students with special needs? We are new to post and learned we can get refunded for substantial or most tutoring fees. I love questions where people say we're new and we need this information. So I love getting the information to people early or it's a refresher for you. So children with special needs may be eligible for the special needs education allowance, also known as SNEA, that covers necessary and eligible special education services. For community members not aware of the resources available to children with special education needs, a good place to start for understanding and to see resources is GCLO's special needs in the Foreign Service Child webpage. We have a wealth of information to help understand the support that the Department of State provides. Additionally, if a parent learns that their child has special education needs, the first step is to reach out to the Regional Medical Officer Psychiatrist, also known as the RMOP, covering your post. If you don't know who your RMOP is, the health unit at post can put you in touch with them. The RMOP will then put you in touch with the Office of Medical Services Child and Family Program, referred to as Med CFP or just CFP. Their department reviews all SNEA applications and eligibility. Med CFP also has a website where you can learn about, the, about SNEA eligibility, documentation requirements, application and appeals process, reimbursement of funds, and SNEA clearances. And that link will be in the chat. It's a very extensive web page with those all of those subjects that you can look through at your own leisure. Uh, allowances also has a very detailed FAQ on this subject that I really encourage you to look into. Uh, it's number nine, we'll drop the link in the chat, but what expenses are allowable for a child with special needs? And they go through all of it. So I encourage you to look at that. For an in-depth look at educating your special needs child in the foreign affairs community, you can go to our GCLO Special Needs in the Foreign Service webpage and watch a Foreign Service Institute hosted recorded webinar from last year with the State Department's Bureau of Medical Services and a regional education officer from overseas schools. In the webinar, they share the process of determining SNEA eligibility, the application process, required documentations, and how families can make an informed decision in their journey to ensuring the best education path for their child at their next post. And if you want an overview of the special needs education allowance, please read the article in the June 2021 issue of the Foreign Service Journal about what's new with special education allowances. We'll be putting the link in the article um, in the chat box. So if you didn't read that article, I really encourage you. It's a great overview. Back to you, Ramona. Okay, Charlotte, I have one more for you. Oh. Sorry, I was just going to say, go yeah, I was just going to add, um, if you missed the most recent of this special education, educating your child in the Foreign Service, there was one yesterday. We will put that link once we receive it from FSI. We will have that newest version available on our web page. Like we said, we try to keep everyone as updated as possible. So back to you, Ramona. Okay, 
Okay, great. Thanks for that tip, Rebecca. And I do have one more question for you, Charlotte, on this topic. How are international schools held accountable if they fail to provide the special needs services they claim to have? Can families curtail without penalty? So international schools are privately run schools with programming that can change throughout a school year or from year to year, depending on staffing changes and possibly funding. It's extremely important for families to work with med CFP and the regional education officer in the office of overseas schools to ensure that the current special needs programming will adequate adequately serve their child. International schools are held accountable for the standards that they are to uphold by the 4 major US academic accrediting agencies that are assisted schools receive. If you have additional questions about special needs programs and services of the assisted schools, I really encourage you to reach out directly to our partners in the office of overseas schools at overseas schools at state.gov and we'll drop that link in the chat. They're very responsive. They want to hear from you. They want to work with you. Um, so please reach out to them. Back to you, Ramona. Okay, thank you so much. That was a lot of really great information on special needs assistance and allowances. Thank you. Next, we're going to switch gears a little bit and pass the next question to you, Rebecca. How does the Office of Overseas Schools determine if a school is adequate? What questions do regional education officers ask during their visits to post? Another really good question. The DSSR does provide the definition of an adequate school. The Office of Overseas Schools has a very rigorous internal set of criteria that they use to determine adequacy. And the regional education officers, the REOs, make these decisions after really careful consideration and consultation with post in the schools. REOs are responsible for reviewing the school's adequacy rating every two years. And if you have further questions, please reach out to overseas schools and the REOs directly. And I need to make a little apology. I said that the uh, webinar was recorded yesterday. It actually was not, but you can go to our webpage and watch the recording from last year. Perfect, thanks for clarifying that. Um, okay, now looking at another educational option, we received this next question. What are the options if I want to send my child to boarding school? Charlotte, do you wanna take this one? Sure, thanks Ramona. Foreign service families can choose the edu educational method that they wish to educate their children. If a family feels that boarding school is an option for their child, they can start their research on the process on our GCLO boarding school webpage. Our team is available for one-on-one -on -one client calls to answer any boarding school questions that you may have. So please email us if you'd like to discuss the boarding school process. I love getting these emails um, because as I said in my intro, I did uh, send our, our youngest to boarding school and uh, it is a process and there is a lot involved and we are happy to walk you through it and then point you to the people that you need to talk to. Uh, additionally, every year, the Foreign Service Institute hosts a fantastic webinar on boarding school as an education option for foreign service youth. And that is coming up this year on December 7th from 10 to 1130. So we'll drop the link, um, the email to FSI if you'd like to register for that. But I, I strongly encourage you to, um, to attend. If you cannot attend on our boarding school webpage, we have a link from uh, last year or, or maybe the year before, but it's fantastic overview of what to expect uh, in the boarding school process. Back to you, Ramona. Okay, thanks. The next question is for you as well, Charlotte. If you are evacuated in the middle of the school term, should students continue with their school at post? That's a great question. That's a tough one. Uh, it depends. So every child is different and it's the family's individual decision regarding school during an evacuation. So we encourage you the very first step for the family is to be in direct contact with the school at post uh, to determine if a virtual learning option is even going to be offered by the school or not, if that's a possibility. Um, there are also time zones and children's ages to consider whether or not a virtual option would work for your child. Families evacuated to the Washington DC area can enroll their children in a public school if they choose to. Our team has established relationships with all of the main points of contact for school districts in the DMV, as we said earlier, and we've put together a general school enrollment guidance checklist that is included in every evacuation message that our GCLO evacuations team sends out 
to the close at post for distribution to all those being evacuated. So if you are ever in a situation where you're evacuated, you will get that document that comes from our team through the evacuations team with everything that you need to know um, and all of the contacts. Thanks, Ramona. Thank you. That was a great question. Thanks for that information. Um, as you can see from all the links that we have put in the chat, we have a, there's a lot of information out there. So hopefully you're taking some of those down. And if not, if you ever need to figure out uh, where something is, just let us know. Um, Rebecca, back to you. We received a few more allowances questions. The first one that I'm going to send to you is, what is the process to get tutoring for my children paid for since they are not getting what they need from the post-sponsored school? So in combination with the school at post allowance or the at post special needs educational allowance, a dependent may be eligible for what is known as the Supplementary Instruction Allowance, or SIA. The purpose of supplementary instruction is to provide dependent children the opportunity to take courses that are not offered at the school at post, but that are customarily offered in U.S. public schools, or to provide additional instruction that may be required by a school for a child to either remain in the same grade or progress to the next grade in that school's curriculum. So our Education and Youth uh, FAQ's webpage has information and links to the DSSR definitions for SIA as well. Um, it's really important to discuss whether the stated purpose applies to your child with the school and the teachers, and then to submit the SF-1190 form and any other additional documentation to the financial management officer at post for reimbursement. SIA is described in the DSSR 274 and 276. Hope that helps. Yep, thank you. The next question is about virtual and homeschooling expenses, Rebecca, and it's a two-part question. So the first part is, are internet setup fees and monthly expenses reimbursed for virtual or homeschooling? And then the second part is, are laptops or similar devices considered reimbursable expenses for homeschooling or virtual schooling? Okay. So internet setup fees and monthly expenses are not reimbursable expenses. And that's because according to the DSSR, um, these are considered to be personal communication services and they are not ordinarily provided free of charge by public schools in the US. Uh, regarding laptops and similar devices, the DSSR 277.3 states that these are reimbursable only if they are rented. So they're not reimbursable if you purchase a laptop or a similar device. So the full current version of the DSSR and all the FAQs related to homeschooling can be accessed on the internet. So you can search those at any time um, that you have a question about homeschooling. You can also refer to the DSSR 960, which is the Education Allowance Worksheet, and that has a full, a really good list of um, allowable and non allowable expenses. And again, you always want to confirm with your post financial management officer to submit your expenses, and then you want to reach out to allowances directly if you have really specific additional questions. Great, thanks. Okay, another one for you came in via Slido is why aren't mandatory field trips covered at schools overseas? Some schools are adding these trips trip costs to the tuition. Okay, so the Office of Allowances Education FAQ number 12 actually answers this question directly. Per the DSSR, costs of overnight field trips are not an allowable expense. However, if it's a day field trip, um, not including an overnight stay, that is allowable subject to the education allowance maximum. In the majority of school districts in the U.S., uh, costs for overnight trips are borne by parents and they're not funded by a school district budget. So um, non-allowable expenses for day field trips include things like uh, the cost of a meal and an admission fee for an, like an an example could be a museum or a cultural event or a performance. So those are uh, non-allowable expenses. All right, and we have one more going back to you. Lots of fun uh, allowances questions. There's so many different, um, different things to think about when you're thinking about education allowances. It's amazing. Okay, so Rebecca, which office is responsible for communicating information about the supplementary instruction allowance, which is 
DSSR 276.9. <laughs> yes, good job. <laughs> so any changes to the DSSR are communicated by the Office of Allowances. They do that via cable as well as on their public website. And that always contains a link to the full current version of the DSSR. There's always a notation at the top of the page whenever there are amendments or changes. And we have several FAQs on our main page, and the Office of Allowances has a separate web page dedicated to FAQs about supplementary instruction. So in addition to that, um, to ensure that the community is aware of DSSR changes, GCLO publishes a weekly newsletter, and employees and family members can sign up to receive it. So we here in GCLO communicate any allowance updates and changes to the Greater Foreign Service community through the weekly, through GCLO's education and youth website, as well as providing this and other types of information through uh, the GCLO Connection, which is a bi-weekly newsletter. It's sent out to the CLO Corps. It has current and updated information on a great number of topics. And the CLOs have this information so that they can then put it into their newsletters at post. So I would advise anyone who has these kinds of questions or wants to know more to go to our website to please sign up for the GCLO Weekly and then reach out to your CLO at post to be added to the newsletter. And all of that, even how to reach out to your CLO at post will be put for you in the uh, chat box in the link. The links will be put there. Great, right, thanks Rebecca. And mm -hmm. just take time for a shout out to our communications and outreach team for putting together the GCLO Weekly. It's, it is really awesome and full of really great information. Okay, that was a lot of great information on allowances. As you can see, the Office of Allowances FAQs are an important resource for you to have to ask educate, for your education questions and of course the DSSR. The next question is regarding gifted and talented funding. Charlotte, sending this one your way. Give Rebecca a little break. <laughs> per an allowances FAQ, DSSR 276.9E, funds can only be used for a gifted and talented program in an academic subject. Are courses and materials supported, excuse me, supporting gifted and talented learners also allowed? Thanks, Ramona. So per the Office of Allowances, when reviewing the DSSR language, an employee may request reimbursement for courses and materials for gifted and talented academics only programs. Uh, so to reduce and eliminate questions by the approving or the certifying official, when requesting reimbursement, employees should consider prudent use of taxpayer dollars when purchasing courses and materials. And just keeping in mind that it's for academics only programming for gifted and talented. Back to you, Ramona. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. The next question addresses sharing feedback on schools overseas. Rebecca, can GCLO or the Office of Overseas Schools please develop a survey for parents to provide voluntary feedback on their experiences at international schools? That's another great question. So um, the answer to that is yes. Actually, GCLO administers a survey every single year, and it's called the GCLO Listening Survey. The survey gives the community the opportunity to provide their feedback on all GCLO programs and services, including education and youth. So the survey is administered annually in the spring. Um, it's announced through emails from the CLO or the management officer at POST. And it's also announced through our additional channels, the GCLO Weekly and our uh, GCLO Facebook page, which we want to also put that link in the chat for you if you'd like to join our Facebook page. And I saw we have a couple questions in the chat. Do we want to answer those now? Sure, go right ahead. Okay. Um, Charlotte or Rebecca? Can GCLO or allowances announce basic information about the supplementary instruction allowance on an annual basis, not just when there are changes? Do you want to answer that, Charlotte, or do you want me to answer it? Go ahead. Okay. So, um, like we said, we are constantly updating our web pages. And so whenever there are changes or amendments, we make sure that the community has access to that information. So um, 
the supplementary instruction allowance doesn't necessarily change on an annual basis. It's only when there are changes or amendments made that, first of all, the Office of Allowances will announce that in a cable, like we mentioned, and they will put it on their public website. And we will then also send that messaging out. So if there aren't any, necess any changes to the supplementary instruction allowance and it remains the same in the DSSR, we're not necessarily announcing that because it's the same, but we will make sure all amendments and updates and changes are uh, sent out to the community in real time and making sure that people have that up-to-date information as soon as it happens. So. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks, Rebecca. And yeah. um, the other question um, about the courses and materials have to be connected to a GT program. Um, I suggest um, that you reach out directly to allowances if you have a very specific question. Um, it depends on the educational method of uh, reimbursement, but please reach out to them at allowancesO at state.gov and um, they can answer your question directly if they if there is a need to alter an FAQ because it isn't clear, they, are, they do that at times, but please reach out to them to get further clarification on your question. Back to you, Ramona. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, also, I do wanna put a plug in, as Rebecca mentioned, the GCLO listening survey. Please keep an eye out for the next one. We truly value your feedback. We share it with our partner offices. And we also encourage you to share feedback directly with your regional education officers on international schools. They are there for you as well. Um, Charlotte, this next question is going to you. Why aren't advanced placement tests or SATs covered? These tests are paid for in the States. Is this something we can ask allowances to cover? Thanks, Ramona. So these two things are separate. So required testing for advanced placement, AP, and international baccalaureate IB courses are covered in US public schools. Therefore, they are an allowable expense under the DSSR 271 uh, as of June 19, 2022. So that's for AP and IB. Now regarding the SAT test fees, the pre-SAT is normally provided free of charge in US public sc schools. However, fees for the SAT or other exams like the ACT for the purpose of admis admittance to post-secondary schooling are not normally provided free of charge by U.S. public schools and are therefore not considered reimbursable. So in conclusion, or just to summarize it, if the standardized test offered by the school at post is similar to the pre-SAT, then that fee is reimbursable within the maximum at post education allowance. Back to you, Ramona. Thanks, Charlotte. Okay, so it looks like we have time for a few more questions. So I'll send another one to you, Rebecca. Who sends out invites to direct hires to contribute to the Foreign Service Institute's post info to go reports? Can they please include EFNs? And can reports be anonymous? Okay, great questions. So the Overseas Briefing Center, or OBC, at FSI requests, collects, and provides content for post info to go reports. So CLO coordinators at each post have a reporting requirement to submit updated core documents to OBC every single year. And the Overseas Briefing Center additionally offers content within the post info to go. And that content comes from a number of offices, from our office in GCLO, from MED, the Office of Overseas Schools, and more. So personal post insights are a really valuable part of the post info to go bidding resources collection. Not only can direct hires and eligible family members, but members of households can also submit these fully anonymous reviews of their current posts at any time. And all of the links to submit and to read the post insights are in the chat. Direct hires can also access post info to go on the intranet. EFMs and direct hires of other agencies who don't have a state.gov address can also access post info to go external. And by doing so, you just send a request uh, to post info to go external at state.gov. Thanks, Rebecca. Another great way to share feedback on post and schools um, with the Foreign Service community. Okay, so I'm going to pass the next question to you, Charlotte. How can starting a new school in the middle of term work 
especially if public school is not an option. Okay, so if, if I understood this question correctly, it sounds like an education allowance inquiry for schooling overseas, as there's no education allowance while in the US. So the question seems to be asking what happens to the money that was used for the first school or the first part of the school year and is there any additional funding for the second school if my child changes schools mid-year? Um, so parents can change schooling for their child mid-year if they choose to do so. However, if POST has paid for the entire school year in advance, then there's no additional funding for the child. However, if POST is only paid for one semester and there is additional education allowance available, then families can check with their FMO to inquire about any residual allowance for the rest of the school year. Um, there's an Office of Allowances FAQ that addresses this question, so I would encourage um, the writer of this question to read that. Uh, it's FAQ number 21, and we'll drop that link. The chat. Back to you, Ramona. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. Um, looks like we have one more question, and then I'll open up to you or Rebecca to see if you have anything to add. Rebecca, this is for you. Can GCLO and the Office of Overseas Schools provide a disclaimer noting that the info on the special needs profiles is self-reported by schools and that the Office of Overseas Schools cannot vouch for its accuracy? Okay, so the Office of Overseas Schools collects and provides the special needs profiles as general information. Um, on their webpage, each individual school has a fact sheet and the special needs profiles. And they have disclaimers that the information is collected directly from the schools. And our GCLO webpage links directly to OS's webpage to access those profiles. So please, uh, whoever sent in this question, you can reach out directly to the Office of Overseas Schools and to the REOs because they are a great uh, resource. Again, the profiles are just general information. If you really want specific information about um, the special needs at a particular school, you want to uh, reach out to the REO for that region, for that post, for that area, and ask your very specific detailed questions there. And all of their information, their contact information will be in the uh, chat as well. Okay, great. Um, Rebecca, Charlotte, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? I think, I, I hope that we've communicated to everyone that um, we are here, we are available. Um, we, we want to give you the answers that, that you need. We want to hear from you. We wanna advocate for you. Um, so please reach out to us at our email. Um, and thanks for joining, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you everyone. These were great questions. Um, and we hope that everyone feels a little bit more like, okay, I understand a little bit more about all these different allowances and how to um, navigate you know, the process of school for children. It's very, very important. And we do want everyone to know we are always here. Please, please feel free to reach out to us at any time uh, with any question. And if we don't have the answer, we will make sure and direct you to um, the appropriate subject matter experts so you can get your questions answered. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, thank you for all the great questions. I hope you can see there are a ton of resources out there for you, including GCLO. Um, we're here for you, as Rebecca said, and Charlotte, anytime you need us. Um, let's see. So I just want to, sorry, to make sure there's nothing else going on. Okay. So we just would like to say thank you for joining us today. Um, we'd like to ask that you take our survey and let us know your thoughts on this session. The link is being placed into the chat box. Um, so feel free to take it when you have a few minutes. We will also email it to you along with links for resources mentioned today. And we look forward to, we do want you to know that we look at all of your responses and we use them to help improve our programs moving forward. Um, as Charlotte and Rebecca said, please reach out to them anytime with questions or even suggestions. We're always happy to hear that as well. And you can give them a call to if you need to speak through or you know talk through a situation or a specific education option that you're looking at. Um, a big thank you to Charlotte and Rebecca for their time and in preparing responses to the questions and for being here today. 
And thank you to our training and communications and outreach teams for working their magic behind the scenes and for putting all the links in the box and uh, making this all happen today. So thank you. Thank you all for joining. And I hope you have a great day, afternoon, evening, night, wherever you are in the world.